Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware, this is a course on English language and literature, and the course is being shared by Professor Krishna Borwa, Department of English, uh, sorry, Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Guwahati, and me. The topic of discussion today is modern English. Uh, we are at the end, almost at the end of the second module and you remember that the second module uh, has been devoted entirely to the history of the English language. We began uh, with an introduction to the history of the English language in general and we have been through several known and established phases okay in the as far as the history of the english language is concerned and today we come to modern english and well it is safe to say that um, there are varying and varied uh, even i may say versions okay of how people um, uh, you know how people talk about in the first place okay or even uh, you know cert certain disagree agreements regarding the very term modern English. Uh, as you know, this is a basic level course uh, uh, whose target audience uh, comprises engineering uh, students, uh, students in various engineering institutes in India and we are, we stick to, um, if I may use the word maybe more or less a traditionalist model of understanding English language and literature. The many varieties, the many controversies etcetera are those that are usually addressed at higher levels or for instance in uh, you know um, departments of English or in major courses etcetera. Right? So, welcome then to uh, the fifth lecture in module 2 of English and English language and literature. Uh, as usual we will do a quick recap of the last lecture. And in the last lecture on which was early modern English, you will recall that there were some, there were a few important developments during that period, right, um, which affected, you know, the further growth and development of the English language, uh, uh, English language and here till here we are largely in the context of the English language in England. Okay? We for instance found that the coming of the printing press was an Im immensely important not only social, but many would say even a linguistic phenomenon. Not the least was also the growth of popular education obviously following the availability okay, of reading material coming from the establishment of the printing press. There was also increased communication during that period of uh, the history of English language and it is but natural that would, there would be a further growth of social consciousness with increased communication with popular education finally emanating from the establishment of the printing press. Then we uh, had occasion to look at as you know A. C. Baugh, Albert Baugh's book um, is a classic as far as the history of the English language is concerned, there, oh, there definitely have been so many books, but one would always recommend that you have a copy of A. C. Baugh's, uh, you know, classic text. And we found in Baugh's text, let us read again from uh, Baugh's history of English language, the real force behind the use of English was a popular demand. And what was this demand? the demand of all sorts of men in practical life to share in the fruits okay to sorry to share in the fruits of the renaissance do you remember the renaissance was the revival of learning uh, the revival in particular in many cases the revival of classical learning okay so here as boss says the real force behind the use of english wa was to be uh, you know attributed to a popular demand Okay, among people to share every everyone people from almost all classes had a desire wished to share the fruits of the renaissance. Next, the revival of learning had revealed 
how rich was the store of knowledge and experience preserved from the civilizations of Greece and Rome. The ancients had not only lived, but had thought about life and drawn practical conclusions from experience. This is particularly what they everyone wanted to know, okay, not to partake, partake not just of you know uh, what is called high classical uh, learning or abstract ideas, philosophies may be, but the population realized okay, um, many of you know the population realized that the ancients had not only lived, but had also thought about life and drawn practical uh, you know conclusions from experience and this was one of the things that was, was sort of you know um, found that was found desirable that was found necessary to emulate to learn and to develop as far as the population was concerned. Further, we found also that much was to be learned from their discussion of conduct, this is very important discussion of conduct and ethics and as you know ethics is one of the, the very important branches of philosophy both classical and modern. Their ideas of government and the state that is of politics, their political precepts, their theories of education and their knowledge of military science and the like. Okay. So, there was as Bohr tells us. Um, and we see in the previous slide also okay, all these contributed to the growth of, of the language. Next, uh, to we also saw we, we went further and explored the, the phenomenon of the rapid spread of popular education during that time and we found that was literacy was becoming more and more common. In Shakespeare's London almost more than half of the people could read. And in the 17th and 18th centuries, there was an increase in the number of schools and the tradesman class, tradesman class arose who obtained education. The rise of the middle class, particularly following uh, you know particularly with the, uh, the industrial revolution, the rise of the mercantile class, the rise of mercantile capitalism. Okay. Uh, was also uh, one of the I would say one of the most important phenomena in England you know in the history of England and there was this, the tradesman class who also uh, you know sought not just uh, uh, you know success in their mercantile endeavors, but also success as far as learning education and as we saw in the previous slide by you know uh, the quotation from A. C. Baugh also uh, a desire to know things classic, to know things Greek and Roman. So, therefore, many have, have also called it the problem of enrichment. Uh, for instance, uh, you know do we look, look at it as enrichment or do we look at it as borrowing. For instance, we have the borrowing of words from Latin. Obviously, if you if you are you know the target of your knowledge is uh, you know uh, is uh, classical Greek and Latin, obviously you would borrow. Okay, it follows that you would wish to borrow among other uh, parts of the, their language and learning system, you would want to borrow words. Okay. So, they, enrichment was also seen as a problem in the sense that it was seen that probably too many words were filtering into, you know, into a language, which uh, may have also been seen by many as a, as a threat okay, to the sort of indigeneity. Uh, of English as it had of, of Anglo Saxon English as it had developed from the times of uh, you know the, Ang uh, the Jutes, Saxons and the Angles. Okay. For then also for uh, uh, you know for if you look at this again this phenomenon of for and against the borrowing of words A C Baugh says the wholesale borrowing of words from other languages did not meet with universal favor. The strangeness as say this is what I mentioned just a while ago the strangeness of the new words was an objection to some people. However, people like the poet for instance, the Augustan poet John Dryden approved of the practice of judicious what he called judicious importations from the classical languages. And we also know that if you, you know those of you who are acquainted or uh, you may also uh, you know uh, look up the lectures in the in, you know in the next module which are on various uh, periods of you know English language and literature in particular. 
the period of Dryden for instance, okay, which is we know, know as know it also as a neoclassical revival uh, uh, you know phase of English literature. Okay. So, so, poets like John Dryden for instance in the 18th century approved of the practice of judicious importations. Well, now um, our uh, let us come back after this uh, recap, let us come back to our topic at hand which we know is modern English and um, there are several texts that you may look up as far as modern English is concerned, but let me declare at the outset that um, my text is largely based on um, this time it is not, a, not uh, uh, you know a conventional traditional text this time it is a text that is published in the, uh, in the on the net and you will find several uh, very very interesting very uh, you know uh, very informative um, you know uh, paragraphs in that and that is the history of English. Okay, and I have given the link here, you may, you may follow this link and try to read up the entire material uh, from which I shall be quoting um, quite extensively and um, this, is, this is to ensure I am quoting that uh, to, to let you know that this is the text on which uh, you know from which we will be reading and trying to understand and, and I shall be trying to explain the points mentioned there. Okay. Now, as I said, said, there are probably many ways when you, uh, you know, uh, for us to look at the phenomenon of um, the, uh, you know, of modern English. Okay, you can talk about modern English from the point of view of global English, for instance. You can talk about modern English from the point of view of what is today known as international English, and it's something that we had seen in the last module. Global English, the globalization of English, was also uh, one of the topics in our last module. Okay, so. Uh, if you go um, by the author of this text, uh, this on online text, um, there are one or two issues which which he says are very important. For instance, uh, vocabulary. Okay, this is also a point we have seen in the last lecture when we talk about early modern English and uh, vocabulary, the contribution of other. Uh, you know um, other uh, languages, the contribution of new developments within uh, the mother country for instance and how they add to the repertoire of words is one of the key and most important I would say most most important points as far as the history of any language is concerned. Okay? Because the coming in of new vocabulary or what we call new words or what we call neologisms. Okay? Uh, these are what these are among the factors including you know along with changes in grammar right uh, major changes in grammar for instance uh, in, 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 in pronunciation etc uh, that keep the growth of a language growing. So, vocabulary is one such important marker if we may use an extensive growth of vocabulary okay, in the modern uh, in modern English. So, this is the first thing that we shall be taking up. Now, according to the text, the history of um, uh, English uh, of English language, uh, there are two. Okay, there are two important socio-political. There are two important socio-political happenings, uh, or you could say phases, that are important. We know that language does not change or grow in a vacuum. We also know that words do not get get added to the repertoire, you know, vocabulary or repertoire of a language by itself. You know, we also know by now that uh, certain political changes are certain social changes, economic changes, of course, are immensely are of immense value, and we need to look at those if, if we even if we have to come back to the growth of the language to see what happens after such changes. So, two as we uh, seen here two socio political events that is uh, events in the sense of these are of course, uh, over time, but we will call them events here. The events are the industrial revolution in England and the growth of the English empire. You are aware that of the you know um, uh, of the, uh, the growth of the, uh, of English of the English empire overseas okay, beyond the mother country following 
uh, the several successful attempts at colonization okay, by, uh, by the British Empire. So, now let us see how these uh, uh, you know this, this aspect of vocabulary is, um, is uh, uh, kind of explored okay, and uh, talked uh, discussed in the text that we are uh, you know borrowing from. Okay. Now, when we look at the issue of science and technology, obviously, when we have the industrial revolution, okay, which is backed by uh, tremendous growth uh, in science in England uh, with, with the scientific uh, laws by Newton and to the for instance to the invention of machines, the steam engine for instance okay, and, the, and the rise of technology as we have seen here. Uh, science and technology would give us new materials, okay, new machines, new means and improved means of transportation. Please look at this slide here and manufacture. Okay. So, what are the points here and from where we are going to see the rise of neologisms, the rise of new vocabulary, these are following science and technology as we have mentioned just a while ago. Uh, new materials being used, okay, new machines being built, transportation, new means of transportation and of manufacture. Now, let us look at this slide and I am here quoting from the history of Eng uh, English as you can see here and I would urge you to follow this to read up the entire text which is, uh, uh, which is quite well written. Okay. Now, let us read from here. Most of the innovations of the industrial revolution of the late 18th and early 19th century were of British origin, including the harnessing of steam to drive heavy machinery. Let us read this again. Most of the innovations okay, of the industrial revolution of the late 18th and 19th century were of British origin, including the harnessing of steam to drive heavy machinery, the development of says here, new materials techniques and equipment in a range of manufacturing industries and the emergence of new means of transportation example steamships railways at least half of the influential scientific and technological input uh, sorry output between 1750 and the 19 in 1900 was written this is very important was written in english Another English speaking country, the USA, continued the English language dominance of new technology and innovation with inventions like electricity, the telegraph, the telephone, the phonograph, the sewing machine, and the computer. As you see here, um, this text clearly refers to the growth, okay, the tremendous growth in manufacturing industries and materials, techniques, equipment, uh, which began. You know, even though later on the USA uh, had so many other inventions okay, in this domain, but it was it was obvious that in the 18th beginning from the 18th century, many of these new technologies, new industries, new materials were developed in Britain. Okay. So, therefore, what are the new words that come in here? Okay. And and I'm borrowing this from the text at hand the industrial and scientific advances of the industrial revolution created a need obviously created a need for new words need for neologisms to describe the new creations and discoveries to a large extent this relied on the classical lines extremely important even now when you go uh, you know to you look at the words uh, in english there are so many words okay that whose prefixes are and also suffixes are of Greek and Latin origin. Okay. So, in order to have you know to, to coin new words okay, neol or neologisms following this tremendous changes in science and technology that were taking place, what was happening was there was a need to, to look at the classical languages Latin and Greek in which scholars and scientists of the period were usually well versed. So, this was you see look at this just before this we had what we had the revival of learning you can see the connection and you can see if I may use the word the sheer almost inevitability of what was going to happen okay, when new words were coined who are they going to look at they are going to look back 
to their love for Greek and Latin, the love for the classical languages following what? Following the renaissance, okay, the revival of learning following uh, you know an, uh, or with running together with uh, uh, you know the growth of neoclassicism, you follow? Okay, so, uh, again let me read this again to a large extent this relied on the classical languages Latin and Greek in which scholars and scientists of the period member were well versed. It is very important for us to realize that being well versed in a language in those times and also today is not just uh, you know what, what, what word should I use it is not just um, it is not just the talent okay of only the literary person or the one person who is doing philology okay or the person who is studying languages okay uh, there were many scientists okay in the 17th 18th centuries who uh, in their while they are doing the sciences okay were concurrently okay very aware of greek uh, of the classical of classical training do you understand? Okay. So, for instance, we have words like oxygen, right? Protein. So, what were the these new words that were being formed? Okay. Some of these words, for instance, uh, were oxygen, okay, protein, nuclear, vaccine. These did not exist in the classical languages. They could be and were perhaps also created by from Latin and Greek Greek roots, right? Uh, for uh, you know as far as optics is concerned for instance you have words like lens okay refraction electron and in biology in the biological uh, sciences you are coming in you know, a words like chromosome chloroform okay uh, uh, and you also had bacteria, bacteria bacteria then words other words like claustrophobia you see claustro and phobia okay this is how they were merging the words are these are just are some of the few examples which have been cited in the text that we are following for this lecture. Okay. These words, uh, these are science based words as it says are created during this period of scientific innovation along with a whole lot of words okay, ending with ologies and onomies. For instance, biology, petrology, morphology, entomology, okay, ethnology, taxonomy, paleontology etcetera. So, these are all words that have been formed by uh, you know uh, taking recourse etymologically to the classical languages to Latin and Greek. Okay. Now, as far uh, um, you know it is not just the, you know, the science that we are talking about, it is not we are not uh, talking only of processes for instance. Okay. We, we saw in uh, you know a couple of we, we saw a couple of slides ago that there were new products, there were new machines and uh, you know following the rise of several kinds of manufacturing industry. Okay. So, following that let us see the words that have been mentioned in this text and what uh, you know the new words that come up are train, engine, reservoir, pulley, combustion, piston and uh, other words like uh, condenser, electricity, telephone, telegraph, lithograph, camera etcetera. We also had new meanings given to words that ha had existed at least in some form okay. and the words that got new meanings during this time were vacuum, cylinder, apparatus, pump, siphon, locomotive factory etcetera. Now, I urge you to you know follow the link that I have provided uh, in this uh, lecture, uh, go to the link, uh, look up the text there, um, look up the slides there and you will understand you will get a whole you know get an, uh, many more words there. Okay. This is just to give you an example of uh, how modern English began really it is safe to say that modern, modern English uh, uh, one of the most important aspects of modern English is vocabulary and we have already linked it to the socio political processes, scientific processes and technological processes that were gaining rapid ground during this time. Now, the other point that I had mentioned was of empire, if you remember it was a growth following colonization, the growth of, uh, of uh, the British empire as you know. Uh, all of us know Indian history, we know that in India too we had uh, the British 
uh, reigning here for several years and there are words is not that they, there was the English language coming in to India, okay, English words coming into India, but we also have words from from uh, uh, from our languages, okay, which became a part also also in Australia, for instance, and so many other parts on, of the Commonwealth. Okay, their words. If you look at the slide here, in fact, you can see the foreign loan words here, right? Uh, following empire and the growth of the empire, these were the foreign loan words. For instance, from Australia, we have boomerang, kangaroo. Okay, from India, we have words like pajamas, bungalow, even the word cot, shampoo, okay, loot, bangle, jungle, etc. These are the words uh, we will find in any English dictionary. And this is a time, as I said, the many words were coming in from following the the growth of empire. Now, also uh, you know the one very important point that we can never miss when we talk about um, we talk about um, you know the uh, about modern English is the American variant. Okay, the American variant. If I may, use, this is a is, is quite um, you know uh, politically loaded to say the American variant of English because today we talk about American English. Okay, so that they safe to say the varieties of English. Now in American English, we find two phases really. The phase beginning 1600, uh, the phase following. Um, the coming of um, the Pilgrim Fathers, right? The, the phase 1600 to 1783, and from 1783 onwards. This is, uh, you know, there's a phenomenon known as language freeze. Now let's read this uh, from the text. Interestingly, some English pronunciations and usages froze when they arrived in America, while they continued to evolve in. Britain itself is interesting. Okay. So, with the Pilgrim Fathers, you have uh, they have brought the English language and their words and the words in the English language. Uh, it so happened that when they settled in America, they tended to preserve those words in their original form, right. Uh, so, sort of that is why they use the word freeze, okay, language freeze. Now, some English pronunciations okay, and even usages, as it says, quote unquote, froze when uh, the uh, British arrived in America, while they interestingly even ironically perhaps they continued to evolve, they continued to change in Britain itself. This is also sometimes referred to as the colonial lag, okay, that is sort of as if the words have lagged behind in their whole process of development and natural sort of natural change. Okay. So, as the, uh, the author here says, interestingly some English pronunciations and usages froze when they arrived in America, while they continued to in evolve in Britain itself sometimes referred to as a colonial lag. So, that in some respects American English is, this is very interesting, okay. American English in some respects is closer to Shakespearean English. Why? As we have seen one of the reasons is this colonial lag or the freezing of these uh, as many would perhaps believe this pristine sort of pronunciation and usages. Right? So, that in some respects American English is closer to the English of Shakespeare than modern British English is. Perhaps and the best example here they give is of the, this word gotten G O T T E N. Gotten is a word which is not um, used in India as far usually used in India as far, uh, far as far as my experience goes. Okay. Gotten is a word used um, in uh, American English and the best known example that is the author gives is of the use of gotten which has long since faded from its use in Britain. Okay. Even though the you know with the prefix for forgotten is still very much a part of modern British. Okay, so where do you, do you get my point? It's not necessary that just because the language comes late, uh, you know, um, from the mother country to to a new country to a new colony, it does and you know it doesn't mean that the new colony is going to you know change this just because it came from the mother country. The very usage and pronunciations and the form of the word will remain the same as if it is frozen in time and as we saw here, a gotten is a very clear example. Now, further the text says the American use of words like fall, 
Okay. So, the word fall for autumn for British in Britain we use the word autumn in India too we use the word autumn though increasingly I find many students uh, even in uh, in IIT here uh, refer to autumn as fall. Okay. Uh, but the American use of words like fall for British autumn, trash for rubbish, hog for pig, sick for ill and guess for think are all examples of these kind of anachronistic British word usage. Okay. Now, there are also other words that were kept, okay. these words were kept uh, even in American English even though they were as it says here they were dropped from the general you know, uh, you know uh, common British usage here. Okay. These words are like burly, burly, greenhorn, uh, talented and scant. Right. This says the America kept several words such as burly, greenhorn, talented and scant that had been largely dropped in Britain although some since have recovered. Do you, do you understand? And other words and words like lumber and, lo and words like lot also which change. It is not that all these words were sort of frozen, all the words they had brought were fro fro frozen. Okay. They began to have very particular sort of maybe we will say American context context um, uh, meanings. Okay. These were words like lumber or words like lot. Right. So, till now what, what did we find? We found uh, two or three important points. Okay. These were a uh, that modern English really can, it can be traced back to two very important socio uh, political economic phenomena and these were uh, the industrial revolution okay, and um, uh, the rise of the growth and the growth of the British empire and we, um, we saw particularly in the case of vocabulary this is Im immensely important and we saw that when science grew, when technology grew and when we had to name new machines, you had to name new processes, scientific processes, what happens is you have to think of you know think of how to build new words and and as I said it was historically um, possible, it was historically almost uh, you could say inevitable that these uh, the scholars, scientists also and um, these manufacturers would turn to the previous age of the revival of the Greek and Latin, okay, uh, the revival of classical learning to coin their new words. Okay. So, this, this part can never be exaggerated, okay. many scholars feel uh, 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 the sociological uh, so sociocultural processes behind it. The second was of course, again a very important point that was the, the coming of the pilgrim fathers to uh, America. Okay, and um, the change in uh, in American English on the one hand as we saw there was this um, refusal to let certain words change right uh, they, uh, that which we call a language freeze or colonial lag there were also words that were retained that were they almost nearly dropped in British English and also we found that there are words that were like lumber and log which began which came to have very specific, uh, American meanings because of the American context, because of, of uh, you know of the kinds of employment, for instance, that uh, the kind of terrain even would uh, you know would uh, impact or have an impact on the kind of words that were being used. So one lesson, very important lesson we get here is language is not just a mental phenomenon. Okay, language is not just a tool to communicate. Language is not um, you know. Uh, just the faculty that we have. Okay. The important thing is language is tied the growth especially when you study the history of any language in any part of the world for that much matter. You can never change or sorry never can never delink it from the important socio cultural processes. You cannot delete it from even the environment, the terrain, you cannot de, uh, you know um, delink it from the kind of jobs people do. Do you understand? Okay. So, this is the beauty of learning. Uh, language from the historical perspective and you see these counterparts you know you see this um, you know concomitantly happening language is changing while the socio cultural scenario is also changing. Further also we have native if you look at this slide here please okay, some of the words that we have picked up from our you know our uh, source text native American words like raccoon now these you may think that these words are really you know 
um, originally English words, but we find that these are native American words which have been added which were taken up by the colonizing population okay, and have become these words have become part and uh, part of the English language and the dictionary and these are um, animals like raccoon, then opossum, moose, chipmunk, skunk, then the word tomato for instance, okay, tomato, squash and uh, the word hickory, right. So, these are the words which were which were part remember we are dealing with vocabulary in this this part of the lecture. Okay? So, these were part became part of the English language. Now, le, uh, let us see this quotation from Thomas Jefferson in the 19 early part of the 19th century in 1813 which is mentioned in uh, you know in this um, web text that we have. This is what Jefferson commented. The new circumstances under which we are placed call for new words new phases, phrases and for the transfer of old words to new objects and American dialect will therefore, be formed. Now, let us look at this again, it is very interesting. Jefferson said the new circumstances under which we are placed. Now, this, this call for you know this demand, the new circumstances demand that there should be new words, there should be new phrases to describe to inhabit this new uh, you know inhabit the, uh, this, these new conditions. He says call for new words, new phrases and for the transfer of old words to new objects and he says an American dialect will therefore, be formed. So, there is also this you know um, the sense of nationalist pride, okay, the need to have not just you know a variant and I would say here uh, not 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 mean a dialect the word dialect today bring a very politically charged word you know because what which language do you call the dialect and why should one language be called the dialect and another language be called a language proper okay these are uh, you know uh, important ideological issues but what Jefferson uh, we find here we are pointing to a, a sort of nationalist pride in wanting to devise a new language and say a new language or new dialect will therefore, be formed because we have new conditions and new situations. The next person which we have to talk about okay, was very important in again in this desire for a new, uh, new, new language for a new vocabulary in particular is if you look at this slide Law Webster. Okay. Now, the word Webster immediately will bring to your mind the Webster's dictionary. So, this was an attempt being made in the US okay, to form or formulate maybe new words and uh, new differences in spelling for instance, why, you know one of if you look at the slide here one of the most important one of the most common things that we, we notice in American text is see the words color and honor. Now, if I ask you quiz what is missing here you definitely would say the word color should be spelt color and the word honor should be that is the u is missing in both cases. Okay. So, there was uh, an attempt being made by Noah Webster in or to sort of prune okay, to prune certain things which he found and many of probably his many of his contemporaries found that they were why, why do we need when you say color why do we need to have the u there. Okay. So, uh, prune these words okay, clean sort of cleanse or clean this word uh, the, the words that are there traveler jeweler okay, why have a double l when a single l would do where they probably saw it as streamlining okay, existing English words and which you know for instance they saw the u in color and the double l in traveler probably uh, you know as um, as idiosyncrasies of a past time. Okay. So, also with as we look at the slide here please Noah Webster's uh, attempt here the new words were a uh, new variants of uh, new spellings were theater, center, color, honor, traveler, jeweler, check for check as you know the British English we use the word check here mask m a s q u e okay, mask check and mask defense and offense we use a c here okay where in fact many of my phd students uh, ask me ma'am sh madam should we write defense as with a c or defense with an s so defense <coughs> sorry and offense plow p o l o w for p 
L O U G H. So, these are all British okay, spellings and these are their American counterparts as uh, the attempt also was, was more or less successfully made by Noah Webster. And also the word, a word an important word really interesting rather is aluminum. So, you do not have the I here, okay, you take out the I you have aluminum right. So, need apparently to find the word aluminum right. Uh, so, Webster is in any extended discussion of American um, American English, okay, the first name that would come to our mind of course, is the name of Noah Webster. Now, I am reading from the next point, now, uh, you know there are several points really to be discussed here as far as vocabulary is concerned and uh, the next point is very important. This is uh, this is what marks I would say modernity and we if you talk about modern English, okay. Uh, not simply from the you know uh, not simply from the point of view of uh, you know uh, just uh, link, uh, changes in grammar for instance uh, you know changes uh, in other in other linguistic ways uh, of course you can never never delink them as i said from the political okay so inclusiveness and political correctness these are the two uh, new things that we find in or new points that we find in the text that we are dealing with. Okay. Now, let us read from this text, the push for political correctness and inclusiveness in the third part of in the last third sorry of the 20th century, particularly by homosexuals, feminists and visible minority groups led to a reassessment of the popular usage of many words. This is very important okay. uh, as difference. Okay, as difference, whether it is a sexual difference, whether uh, you know it is difference as far as various issues of culture are concerned. Okay, there is, you'll, you'll, as you understand, the uh, the one of the hallmarks of modernity is, of course, to accommodate, if not to accommodate, at least to recognize the heterogeneity in culture, in sexuality. Okay, so in the, the text here says that particularly in cases of homosexuality of in cases of feminism of women's rights and of the rights of minorities there has been uh, i would say almost a radical okay reassessment of the way in which we use words okay in the way in, in the in as he says there is a popular usage of many words okay next uh, keep reading feminists call into question the underlying sexism in language example words like mankind Okay, now, when you, we, we are taught that the word mankind includes okay, both men and women, but feminists would say no, we, we cannot have a word with only man, because as many feminist linguists have also point out, pointed out, okay, uh, mankind at some maybe psychological or cognitive level may lead you to a woman to think. Wait, wait, am I included here or not? Do you understand? Okay. So, the word the seemingly innocent word mankind today is no longer as innocent as you may uh, you know or, or uh, free of any political um, gender connotations as you may find. So, words like mankind, chairman, male man etcetera. Okay. So, the, the privileging you know of the privileging of man the term man has go, has been through as I said a radical reassessment uh, giving rise to words like as you know chairperson. Okay. So, instead of chairman you use the word chairperson, because it is not necessary that every time the person who is chairing either a department or chairing a meeting or chairing a session is a man. Okay. So, chairperson is then the you know, supposedly gender neut neutral term. Okay. And this, these changes have come about and characterize one part of what we call modern English. So, feminists have called, uh, called into question the underlying sexism in language, example mankind, chairman, male man etcetera and some have even gone to the lens of positing her story. Now, as an alternative to his story, history is seen as meaning his story. So, the word her story and those of you who are interested in, in feminist uh, you know uh, theory in feminist concepts in fem feminist language for instance, okay, some of you may have come uh, across the word her story. Okay. This that is a story from 
uh, could be a story from a single woman point, woman's point of, point of view, but could also be history, entire history uh, you know, of a nation or of a community or, or, you know, or, or, or of any phenomenon okay, in the social sciences and humanities uh, narrated okay, from a female perspective. Do you follow? So, words like her story have come into the English language precisely in this bid to form a reassessment okay, uh, of uh, you know, the use, use of popular words and to coin here again we find her story is a new, new word, it is a neologism. Coining of neologisms uh, depending uh, on, on the reassessment of usage of words. Then next uh, the text mentions here for a time strong ob objections were voiced at the inherent racism underlying words like for instance blacklist, blackguard, blackmail and blackboard. Okay. We have moved from the disparaging term negro, okay. we no longer refer to uh, the black person as, as negro. Okay. Um, we, whenever a person uses the word negro, we consider him or her as politically insensitive, okay, as racially insensitive or even racist. Though of course, the irony is that um, you know the black person uses the word nigger or um, uh, negro within the black community, which is a different, different matter. Okay. You can turn this sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, slur phrase uh, or you know um, and, and turn it into uh, you know, use it in such a way that you can use it only within your community. Right? So, well, even today you find that the word black may not be accepted, okay, readily accepted. You find the increasing use of terms like Afro American okay, to refer to, to blacks. Do you understand? So, we have words like blacklist, blackmail, um, etcetera. So, uh, these words have been used over the years, but these have now been now come into question. Why? Because it refers and because of our, you know uh, probably some people may even have the tendency to refer or to make some sort of uh, a bizarre connection between black man and black male for instance. Okay? So, these are some of last, but not the least is we cannot uh, leave out discussions about the information age. Okay, and the impact it has had on uh, the English language. Right? So, let us let, read from the text here. English is the dominant language of the internet or the so called information superhighway, which links together network computer, computers all over the world. Although still in its infancy, the internet has led to the development of new types of text, which require new skills. Conventional skills such as the ability to write prose are largely irrelevant and this is and this is to the advantage of the many users whose native language is not English. It is very important. Look at the last point made here. The kind of language okay, and we cannot reiterate this enough. The kind of uh, skill in the English language, uh, the kind of mastery of the English language that was required uh, you know required for one to be known as maybe you know with er, not just erudite in the language and its literature, but also somebody who, who could even you know um, where it could make a difference in one getting a job or not. Okay. Uh, today that sort of mastery uh, is something that need not you know uh, need not be, be uh, expected from somebody applying for a job on uh, you know uh, uh, on the digital platform. Okay, so, this is a very important point. The old kind of mastery about of English of its words of its turns or phrases for instance are not today so important as far as the digital platform is concerned. Okay. As it says here this is to the, to, the, to the advantage of many users particularly outside of the USA and outside of England. Okay. Those users of the language whose native language is not English today can no, we may use the word a different English with a different, you know, repertoire of words. Okay, so that interestingly, they they are at par, okay, as far as jobs uh, relating to the cyber world to the internet uh, are concerned. Okay, for instance, 
we also have words like uh, byte, cyberspace, software, hacker, laptop, hard drive, database, these words were never there uh, you know in uh, even if they were they were never there in the way that in which we understand those words to mean. So, we will end with uh, a quotation from um, a cultural history of the English language again another in very important interesting text if you, if you want to know the history of the English language from the point of view of society and culture and I will end with this quotation within a generation of the invention of the computer the computer industry was established on a global scale using English as its language. As the computer culture has expanded into large scale databases, electronic mail or email and so on, the expansion of English has followed and this technology is so designed that the user needs to interact in English. Individual programs can of course, use other languages, but the program itself will almost certainly use English based commands. Whereas, in previous technological revolutions, the technology has had to be adapted for different languages. In this case, languages other than English have to be interfaced with the resident language of the technology. So, if you look at the you know the difference in these two things and what our uh, main text is saying here and the text that we have uh, from a cultural history of the English language. We may end by saying that you know in English in the computer age uh, is really Yana's face. Yana's face is Yana's was uh, you know uh, an entity with two faces okay, in, in mythology in Greek mythology Yana's is an entity with two faces. So, this has two faces really A is as the cultural history of the English language says that most of the work done on the internet okay, is in English and say, say the computer culture has expanded into large scale databases expansion of English has also followed. Okay. So, that even if you know uh, you know even if languages other than English are to be used they have to more or less let me put it since I am not a person from computer science okay, more or less as this book mentions here has to be interfaced with the English language. On the other hand we also find that very importantly that the older way of knowing the English language okay, you know for instance you may have found people in, other, in previous you know generation they are they, they are masters in the English language. I said they know, know the nuances, the turns of phrase, the uh, long winding sentences. Many may know a Shakespearean play by heart. That sort of knowing of the English language is today no longer re required. And, and is the, our main text says here may be also at a great advantage for people whose native tongue is not English, but from the you know from from the point of view of the computer industry. Okay, uh, they will not fall behind just because they do not know an English of a more, more what, what should I use of a let us say of a, of a different variety altogether from the previous generations. Okay. So, there is much really to be said and I have I am aware um, instead of saying so many things in uh, you know in very brief points about um, uh, about modern English what I had decided here to do is to point to one aspect <coughs> sorry of modern English which is vocabulary right. Because of course, vocabulary has throughout been a very important point in uh, you know in particularly in the growth of the English language you find as one of its pillars really one of its most pillar, uh, important rapidly growing uh, phenomena and is also of course, phenomenon sorry of course, um, almost like a law that <coughs> that change in, vo in vocabulary is going to happen over change in time. But we here we find an uh, almost uh, uh, a remarkable way in which vocabulary has changed particularly in the modern age with uh, with the phenomenal and very rapid growth of uh, science and technology be beginning with the industrial revolution as we saw in the 17, 18 centuries and um, science in the 17, 18 centuries and culminating in the computer industry. Okay, having implications as we saw also of whether people may ha get a job may have a, a job based on their knowledge of kind of English that they know. Okay. So, if you ask a question on you know say something like uh, point out <coughs> sorry one of the most important areas uh, in modern English okay, that makes it different from its earlier age then you would point out point 
talked about vocabulary. If you are asked a question like name two socio cultural or socio political socio cultural phenomena owing to which there was a rapid growth of technology, uh, sorry, rapid growth um, of technology, yes, and the growth of vocabulary as far as mod, uh, English is concerned in the modern age, then what are the, what's the, an, what are the answers? You know, A is industrial revolution and B is the growth of empire. Next, you may also be uh, asked a question like uh, bring out some of uh, the, the you know uh, attempts being made in America, okay. uh, bring out some of the changes or differences as far as British English and American English is concerned. You have, of course, uh, we have several books uh, where we can you know go into detail, but we the names you need to mention uh, 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 you know uh, is one name specifically is that of Noah Webster in his attempt to prune or sort of clean uh, certain extent words of their what shall we call it of their you know the overload of their letters. For instance, we found words and you may get questions like inside certain words. Okay. Also, we found you know that we can uh, also you can have questions on what happens when you know what are the words that get, have gotten into uh, into the um, English dictionary following empire okay, and the colonization, then you can talk about words from native American. What are the words? We saw words like chipmunk, okay, even tomato, right, uh, opossum and words from, uh, uh, from Australia like boomerang, words from England like pajama, etcetera, okay, bungalow, etcetera. So, these are some of the questions that at this level, okay, remember this is, uh, this is a basic level uh, course that we are bringing to you and these are basic level, but however basic they may sound to you, it is always go, it is always better to go back to basics okay, and to recall some of the important things that we uh, you know we have learned so far. So, thank you and uh, uh, we'll end this uh, lecture here and we the next lecture will be the last lecture on this um, uh, in this module and which is entitled uh, the history of English in India. Thank you.